Good afternoon, everybody. And my name is Daniel Gray. I welcome you all to this Wednesday seminar today, where it's my pleasure to introduce Misty Jenkins. Um, I'd first like to start by acknowledging and celebrating the lands upon which we meet today. Um, the, uh, the owners and the custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and embrace their continued connection to this place. So, um, as I said, yeah, it's my delight to introduce Misty Jenkins to you all today for today's Wednesday seminar. She joined WEHI and the Immunology Division as a lab head back in 2016, following a really successful postdoctoral period, both at the University of Cambridge and the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute. It was there she drew on her experience in T-cell receptor biology to start a new program of research at the Institute focused on the design and application of chimeric antigen receptor T-cells for the treatment of brain cancer. So CAR T-cell therapies enlist the potent anti-cancer um, capabilities of T-cells by engineering receptor fusion proteins that can target the tumors to, to lead to their eradication. They've been a real amazing new arm in immunotherapy for cancer. Um, MISTI's program has catalyzed many great new collaborations in the Institute and drives an important focus for the Brain Cancer Center. Misty will tell you more about some of the exciting discoveries that her team have been making in her seminar today. But in addition to all of this, Misty is an exceptional leader who's made really remarkable contributions both within and beyond the Institute, particularly in the domains of the promotion of women in STEM and uh, in the Indigenous community. And it is, she's a true triple threat. And it is for these contributions, she was recently recognised by the award of the Order of Australia, the preeminent recognition for outstanding surface to Australians. And so thank you, Misty, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, uh, for that really generous introduction. And I too start to acknowledge uh, the beautiful country uh, in which we're meeting on today and also streaming from for those of you online. As a proud Gundijamara woman that grew up on Wadawurrung country, uh, we're coming to you today from the uh, traditionally uh, land traditionally owned by the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I really honour um, the Wurundjeri's unbreakable connection to this awe-inspiring place. And I think with the uh, upcoming referendum uh, nationally and also the state constitutional, uh, the state uh, elections for the First People's Assembly, uh, that we just held last weekend, uh, I stand shoulder to shoulder with my Indigenous brothers and sisters where uh, their voices are uh, acknowledged, are respected. Uh, and recognised. So as Dan said, I'm um, really pleased to be here and, and present some work that we've been working very hard on over the last five years with a vision of applying immunotherapy, the specialised subset of immune cell killers um, in the fight against brain cancer. But as an immunologist, uh, it would be remiss of me not to start my seminar, seminar by really championing the humble T-cell, as shown here in this beautiful lattice light sheet microscopy movie. This is a T-cell crawling across the dish. And of course, these specialised group of cells uh, play a really crucial role in the immune, in the immune system against both uh, pathogens and cancer, whereby they recognise their target cells, as shown here by this orange T-cell forming this uh, strong immune synapse with the blue cancer target cell where they then uh, induce the kiss of death. And with laser-like precision, as shown here in this beautiful movie on the left, the microtubule organising centre, which sits normally nestled next to the nucleus, separates and docks at the plasma membrane where signalling has occurred and then directs all of that cellular machinery towards the target to induce death. And that looks like this, as shown by all of these secretory granules shown here in red, rapidly polarising here towards this cancer target. And perforin then forms pores in the target cell membrane through which granzymes pass through and induce mostly apoptosis, although it would be remiss of me to come from Weehi and not mention all the other forms of cell death that they can also induce, which is a topic for another day. And, um, and in fact, this, the role of immunosurveillance was, uh, has been a controversial topic in cancer and it was really first proposed back by Burnett and Thomas in the 1950s, our own McFarlane Burnett, who expanded the theory that the immune system evolves to keep us free from pathogens and expanded it to say the immune system also actually evolves to detect and destroy pre-malignant cells. So therefore, cancer is a failed immune surveillance. However, it took another 50 years for this to formally be demonstrated. Um, initially, when mice were generated that lacked key effector molecules, such as perforin interferon gamma, was shown to spontaneously develop tumours. 
And then further evidence came uh, not until 1996 in this really seminal paper now by um, Gallon and colleagues published in Science, um, which showed that patients that, and this is the y-axis here, is patient-free survival of colorectal cancer, and the patients that had T cell, a T-cell response to their tumour and where the T-cells were observed at the tumour margins and infiltrating the tumour had a much better prognosis, as shown here in the top here, regardless of the stage of cancer, stage 1, 2 and 3, shown in these different colours. So this really highlighted the importance of the immune system for cancer outcomes. Because see, for centuries, we're only, in fact, dating back to the ancient Egyptians, all we had available was surgery. And of course, that's far more sophisticated these days. Um, and then around 1900s uh, radiation, when Pierre and Marie Curie, of course, discovered that radi radium could kill diseased cells. And then around the Second World War, chemotherapy, when mustine gas depleted soldiers' bone marrow and chemotherapy was born. And we really hadn't had a lot since. And so these new age molecular targeted therapies and, and immunotherapies have really become um, the fourth and fifth pillar of the way we think about and treat cancer. And back in 2013, uh, cancer immunotherapy was considered landmark um, a breakthrough of the year by Science Magazine. There's plenty of seats down here, so come down the front for those of you standing at the back. Um, so there are various forms of immunotherapy, uh, but my research focuses on cellular immunotherapy, and that's what I'll take you through today, which really uh, takes advantage of um, um, native T cell uh, receptor signaling. So T cells recognize antigens through their T cell receptor as shown here. They recognize peptide MHC um, in the form of signal one, which uh, signals non-covalently through the associ association with CD3 zeta. And then other co-stimulatory molecules um, uh, come in the form of signal two. And there's a, a variety of different flavors of these. And so really the CAR, CAR or chimeric antigen receptor takes advantage of this mach signaling machinery by co-opting the signaling domains fusing them to transmembrane domains to express them at the cell surface, and then the all-important antigen um, binding domain. And uh, so this is a sort of basic structure of a car. And most cars utilise, um, traditionally, they were all reverse engineered from monoclonal antibodies um, into their heavy and light um, antibody binding domains. And, um, and I'll refer, you'll hear me refer to this today as the SCFV or the single chain variable fragment. Um, but these days can also be uh, formed just heavy chains, so from nanobodies like Wei Hong's alpaca program, or also um, from ligand receptors. Um, and our research, uh, like uh, T cells, and you'll see the star of the show enter from the bottom of the stage here, the green T cell, which will flash bright green when it recognises its target. Um, and just like a native T cell uh, receptor induced killing, CAR T cells also induce serial, uh, serial killers. And so they're able to, in quick succession, take out a whole um, load of these cancer targets as shown by the uptake of propidium iodide in this form of this red dye. And so this schematic is a really simplified version of what the, the patient journey looks like if they're receiving a CAR T cell therapy. So initially, um, after a cancer diagnosis, blood is harvested from the patient and their T cells are purified and expanded in culture. The T cells are subsequently then transduced with uh, vectors containing CARs and tradition, mostly this is with viral vectors, although, um, you know, modern advancements are looking at uh, mRNA delivery and lipid nanoparticles, for example. Um, the T cells are then proliferated and expanded up in culture. And then, of course, they're uh, usually in sort of uh, specialised wave reactors and clean rooms. And then importantly, they're delivered back to the patient. And this field, this field of CAR T cell immunotherapy has been really rapidly changing. And I would say even in the last 12 months, we've learned so much about um, the, the, the CAR T cell dosing and the cadence and the route, and the route of administration. And this therapy has had its successes. This is Emily Whitehead, who made medical history as being the first paediatric patient to receive CAR T cell therapy at five years old for her refractory acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. And so Emily received an anti-CD19 CAR T cell product, which ablated all of her B cells, her disease cells, and her healthy cells. And so we can do that with blood cancers, and that's what makes solar cancers more challenging. Um, and now there have been uh, six FDA-approved um, uh, therapies approved by the FDA, uh, all for blood cancers, including multiple myeloma, targeting a protein called BCMA. And really, Emily, Emily's remarkable response and, and you know, those of uh, the other children on this program really paved the way a decade ago for the successful application in other patients. So now I want to take you through a story, and it's a story of me starting my lab here at Weehai. And, you know, when I started my lab, I met a remarkable PhD student at the time in Tony Burgess's lab, Ruth Mitchell, who um, at the time was uh, training to be a neurosurgeon across at RMH with Prof Drummond and Prof Kay. 
And she told me she was sick of telling pa their patients that they were going to die. She said, I just, it is heartbreaking turning up to work every day and ha just having no treatment options for these patients. We're throwing all these brain tumours in the bin. No one's working on brain cancer and something must be done. And there was a real urgency to her call. There was an urgency in her voice. And so what started as quite a serendipitous conversation over a coffee here on level seven, between a coffee between two friends, I, rap I look back now and rapidly realise that it was a quite a turning point in my career. Because um, you see the blood-brain barrier, which is a protective uh, barrier that prevents, you know, it's been evolutionary designed to protect our body, to protect our brains from pathogens and toxins and drugs, actually safeguards this delicate environment. Um, but, uh, but of course, T cells do cross the blood-brain barrier and the brain actually does have quite an active immune response. And so, you know, in terms of all uh, cancer therapies like chemo and small molecules and drugs, immunotherapy, uh, particularly um, for an indication like brain, really held a lot of promise. And brain tumours um, are actually made up of 100 different histologically unique subtypes, all with their own epidemiology and clinical characteristics. Um, but overall, um, if we lump them all together and talk about them in generality, the prognosis is extremely grim. And brain cancer kills more children than any other disease, fact. And we think this is pretty horrific. Um, one of the most devastating is a brain stem tumour called diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, or DIPG. It grows in the brain stem. Your brain stem controls your breathing and your swallowing. And so it's surgically inoperable. Uh, it's resistant to chemotherapy and radiation is merely palliative. Uh, and unfortunately, it has the most grim prognosis and is universally uh, fatal for these school-aged children. And in adults, glioblastoma is, uh, is the most common brain tumour and also the most aggressive. It's really known for its poor prognosis. The average survival is really less than 15 months post-diagnosis. And despite um, some advancements um, in, in treatment options, we really are still treating patients today the way we're treating patients, the way we were treating patients 30 years ago. Um, apart from I'm looking at my consumer in the audience, Gian, who's just shown a remarkable response to a new immunotherapy drug. So I think that there is hope on the horizon. But that's why we're here. So in the context of CAR T cell therapy, the treatment of solid tumours uh, possesses greater challenges to those of liquid tumours. Really, the main, um, I think the, the biggest challenge to overcome is the heterogeneity of the tumour. So unlike a, a leukaemia where you can target CD19 or CD20, there's a lack of good available tumour-specific targets across solid tumours. And even if, even when we do identify tumour-specific targets, sometimes, sometimes they are only expressed in 30, 40, 50% of the tumour bulk. And so we need to um, do you need to find new targets. We need to improve um, trafficking and infiltration of the T cells into the tumour, and we need to address and overcome the immunosuppressive uh, tumour microenvironment. So what's been done so far? This is it. It's not a lot. And you can see, you know, in the yellow box on the left was 2012, where Emily was first treated, and I started my lab in 2006. And there'd only been one paper at this time. Uh, published, full stop, uh, applying CAR T cell therapy in, um, in brain cancer. And so on the sort of the top here, I'm showing you what's been done in, in, in kids and adults are across the bottom there with a bit of a timeline. And you can really see that um, overwhelmingly there's still small numbers and it's still early days. So there's been 12, and this is, this is just reported, not ongoing trials, uh, 12 paediatric patients treated and, and 42 adults. And most um, most recently, just a Nature paper last year published four papers, uh, four patients rather, um, that were treated with a GD2 specific CAR T product uh, for their brainstem DIPG tumour, and three out of the four showed um, tumour regression. So if I was to summarise all of that literature for you, really these are the take-home learnings, which is there have been small numbers, but in the in those trials there was relative there was shown to be relatively safe. So there were uh, relatively low toxicities. Um, in fact, tumour regression was observed, and in fact, brain cancer has been one of the most solid tumours that's shown um, quite good tumour progression, a tumour regression in patients. For those studies that bothered to look, there there were um, there was evidence of T cell engraftment and persistence, uh, but not every um, study reported that. Um, and I think, as I said, we're learning even in the last 12 months that the route and the cadence of administration is changing. The early studies used um, sort of single intravenous doses and, and, and studies are coming out now and, and ongoing studies are actually injecting the CAR-Ts straight into the brain. 
Um, but overwhelmingly, um, the tumours escaped. I think one other thing that we don't really talk enough about when we think about, um, we talk, you know, we show tables of prognosis and, 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 and outcomes, but, you know, the quality of life improvements. These are kids, this, is, this was from the, the Nature paper last, uh, last year from Robbie Raz, uh, Mazda's trial. And, um, and, you know, these, you know, school-aged children that could, that could smile and eat and talk to their parents and go to the playground and colour in a horse. And I think, you know, whilst these patients ultimately succumb to their disease, unfortunately, um, that, uh, that there were also quality of life improvements. So this is where we started our journey. And my lab's really interested in applying CAR T cells in uh, for brain cancer. And so if we just come back to this schematic to anchor the way I'm going to structure the rest of my talk, I want to talk you through how that patient journey is really driving all of the core programs within my lab. So we have programs right from um, looking at how best to integrate a variety of signals, including looking at the manufacturing protocols for T-cell activation, both in the form of that um, co-stimulation co agonists. Overwhelmingly, all clinical trials that manufacture CAR T-cells use anti-CD3 and anti-CD28 beads. Um, and, and we have evidence, actually, if we change this, we, we can um, tailor more uh, effective T-cell phenotypes, um, and looking at also the effect of the local cytokine milieu when we're activating, uh, activating these T-cells and examining their propensity for uh, function and exhaustion. And this is a wonderful ongoing collaboration with the Hodgkin Lab. Next, we come to um, CAR design, which is really critical. And in fact, every single amino acid in that receptor can actually quite strongly influence and dictate function right from the proximity of the signaling domains um, to the plasma membrane. And I'm just going to give you one tiny snapshot um, of, of evidence of um, the importance of all of these domains. For example, um, work, um, lovely collaboration with the CORE lab revealed that the choice of transmembrane domain can strongly influence activation, whereby they generated um, cars with um, uh, synthetic transmembrane domains controlling for the oligomeric state of the receptor and therefore strength of signaling and showed that um, an in strong influence on function. Um, and also through to uh, the affinity of the receptor, of course, and the all important choice of the co-stimulation domain. And some really beautiful work by a uh, talented postdoc in my lab, Brian Cross, is examining uh, the phosphoproteomic profile of different signaling domains and looking at how they synergize with drugs. So then we get to the combination therapies and, and how we actually deliver these uh, therapies to patients. And so we also have program in the lab examining how best to deliver combination therapies and targeting multiple targets simultaneously. We know that CAR T cells won't be a silver bullet. They're not, we're not going to be able to use them effectively as a monotherapy. We're going to have to um, apply these therapies in a combination format by uh, carpooling, for those of you that love a good pun. Um, but you know, whether we're you know, asking really simple biological questions whether we have a receptor, you know, have single car specific cells that are just pulled together and car pulled, or whether we have multiple receptors expressed on the one cell and how that changes the propensity for exhaustion, for example. Um, and, also the, uh, and also the complexity of manufacturing comes into this too. And so we started a really nice collaboration with uh, Marco and Andrew and the Magic Facility because in order to examine these um, multiple immune responses to human antigens, we needed to do this in a syngenaic, preferably black six model um, that required expression of multiple tumor antigens and so we had to make tolerized mice and so we did that together and uh, this is a lovely work of Hannah in the lab who's just about to submit a PhD thesis. Um, and then importantly, of course, these CAR T cell therapies are then delivered by various routes of administration and a variety of dosing regimes and in a variety of um, uh, you know ratios, for example, of you know CD4 to CD8 uh, T cell ratio and where they traffic to the site immediate tumour regression. But overwhelmingly, as I've mentioned already, the biggest challenge in the field is that they do immune escape. So whilst we can deliver these and we can see good um, tumour regressions, ultimately it just takes those few clones um, to then downregulate that antigen or to be negative for it um, and the tumour will grow back. So we need, new we need new targets, we need new tools in the toolkit, so to speak. And so we, um, we really uh, doggedly and determinedly set out to, to do this on a, on a large scale. And we really wanted to carefully map the brain tumour cell surfaceome so that we could identify new and novel targets. 
And um, why hasn't this really been done yet? The, really, I think the whole field has suffered um, for decades over just a lack of good um, available fresh tissue. And so we take advantage of our good, um, wonderful neurosurgical team, um, both here and now across the country, where we can use cell surface proteomics. So we're in a lovely collaboration, and this is driven by a talented postdoc in my lab, Brian Cross, and a collaboration with a proteomics facility here at Weihai, we take advantage of the fact that cell surface proteins are glycosylated. So we can biotinylate them, pull them down and use mass spectrometry to identify um, the proteins expressed at the cell surface, which leads us to then comparing these to healthy tissue and our, ultimately our CAR targets. And so you will have seen from the pipeline um, that I showed you earlier, there's really only been a handful of targets identified uh, for brain cancer to date. And so this has been really a large piece of work in the lab and, and uh, involved uh, many people over the years now. Um, and really we take the top the no, top expressed, high, high abundantly expressed proteins and we detect, we get pretty good resolution. We get about 3000 cell surface proteins uh, expressed at the surface and then use a variety um, of online and bioinformatic tools to triage these lists. And interestingly, um, we actually see a lot of uh, proteins that normally reside intracellularly. So these are things that would not necessarily be detect, you know, picked up on an RNA-seq analysis, for example, but are mislocalized to the cell surface in cancer. So while we're accumulating um, primary tumors, we established the protocol to build um, to build this sort of uh, workflow here uh, on a validated target. So to take something from target identification, know that we can make and screen the antibodies, that we have all the tools in place to test the immunological function of these therapies, and then now we're um, just ready to take our first assets into the clinic. So we, um, we in collaboration with our uh, with the neurosurgical team at RMH um, and leveraging local expertise, uh, we settled on uh, making binders for EGFR V3. So EGFR is a, a transmembrane receptor tyrosine kinase proteins and expressed in normal skin, so it's in normal uh, epithelial cells. Um, but uh, overexpression of EG, EGFR is also uh, implicated in the pathogenesis of many cancers, and of Common truncation here is called EGFR V3. It's a truncation mutation, and it's expressed in a third of all glioblastoma tumors. And so it's what's great about this protein is that it's exquisitely cancer specific. So it's not going to kill targets to it, are not going to kill healthy tissue. So we worked with a local Melbourne biotech company called Mirio to use their fully human germline platform um, to screen for binders. And they pulled out 10 binders that were EGFR V3 specific. Um, and then we worked with our colleagues at the Doherty to perform SBR analysis, and they were found to be a very high affinity. So you'll, you'll hear me to refer to these clones. I'm just going to focus today on GCTO2, which was our lead, uh, lead candidate. We then uh, worked with Melissa Call and Margarita in the math lab and used deep mutational scanning uh, to predict the critical binding residues of our GCTO2 binder. And we compared this to the commercially available EGFR-specific binder called Cetuximab. Um, and critically found that when these two mutation, uh, when these two residues were mutated, we lost binding. And so we confirmed the affinity and the specificity of our clones, and then we subsequently uh, proceeded to engineer them into a car. And so this is the second generation car, car construct used in these studies. It has a CD28 and CD3 Zeta uh, signaling tail, and uh, and retrovirally uh, uh, transduced. Uh, primary T cells. So we use retrovirus in our mouse setting and we use lentiviral for our human T cells um, and got really good car expression at the cell surface. So we know that we could make these into cars and, and, and uh, make good car T cells. Now, EGFR expression is uh, generally pretty poorly maintained on cells in culture. So as soon as you take these tumours out of the brain and put them in a dish, they are uh, very different. Uh, so we generated um, some transduced glioblastoma cell lines. So these are three different adult glioblastoma models I'm showing you here, where we've overexpressed um, stably EGFR V3 to use as a, a utility as a cell line, cell model for our targets. And then when we can co-incubate these targets with our CAR T cells that we've generated and uh, we form a killing assay and see how well that they can induce cytotoxicity. And so we take advantage of the local uh, incu sites here at Weihai and measure the uptake of propidium iodide into the target cells as a readout of killing of these three different models. And you can see that our GCTO2 binder in purple killed um, really nicely. Um, and it was equivalent with the Novartis uh, clinical benchmark 2173. 
And this is just a really small snapshot um, of a lot of data, but really just also showed that they killed um, specifically and induced a, a, a mostly apoptotic form of cell death, um, and that they also were able to uh, induce good both cytokine and chemokine secretion from the uh, GCTO2 specific CAR T cells in response to EGFRV3 specifically. But of course, we are interested in making these therapies uh, with the clinic in mind and critical for any investigation or new drug application is to demonstrate safety against primary healthy tissues that might express a similar isoform of your target. So in this case, uh, we screened against um, healthy keratinocytes. So these are three um, primary um, primary keratinocyte um, samples here that are literally taken from skin and straight into a dish. So it's a one hit wonder kind of assay. And, um, and we used astrocytes as a, a negative control. So these keratinocytes here have very high expression of EGFR and we didn't see any cross reactivity of our binder. So um, I'm not showing the data here, but we also made CRISPR uh, EGFR knockout uh, variants as well, uh, just to prove the specificity. So we were really confident at this stage we had some specific good binders that exhibited excellent function. So we then proceeded to test them in vivo. So to do this, we had to establish um, the intracranial platform uh, here at Weihai, and this is our uh, this is our resident mouse neurosurgeon Melinda at the rig, implanting orthotopically implanting brain tumors into mice, um, and we inject very very so think about a drop, you know, it's like a quarter of a drop, it's a tiny tiny volume, um, in a, w with a slow pump over a, a number of minutes. So these experiments, you know, to get one cohort of mice takes a, it's a, the the, you know, the the team is really here doing 20 hour days to do these experiments. Um, so the, the tumours are implanted, the tumours are labelled um, with luciferin, um, luciferase and uh, grown and after a week implanted with the CAR T cells. So the CAR T cells are generated as single uh, specific CD4 and CD8 T cells and then we deliver them in a mixed one to one ratio uh, to the mice and then we examine using the IBIS bioluminescence imaging weekly over time. So we made these uh, novel high affinity um, GCTO2 second generation CAR T cells and, and treated the mice. And our negative control here are mice that have been treated with T cells but without the CAR. Uh, the, the clinical benchmark here, and here's our GCTO2 treated mice, and they were um, there was beyond beneath the limit of detection uh, and bioluminescence uh, by their first week after um, IV transfer. And then we um, uh, sent brains to the clinical pathologist uh, down at the Royal Children's Hospital, Colleen Darcy, who scored them blindly. And you can see the very large tumour burden here in this empty uh, T-cell treated brain um, and just no tumours here in the O2 treated brain. So we were um, pretty thrilled to see this result. This, is, this was an um, experiment with mouse uh, CAR T cells. And so we repeated the same set of experiments with human CAR T cells treating the human tumour um, and also saw a similar result whereby we saw um, total clearance here on the bioluminescence and, and very long survival. In fact, this is over 220 days, which is uh, nearly half the lifetime of the host before we decided to end the experiment. So then we then wanted to go back and examine how uh, effective our CAR T cells were at infiltrating um, the tumours. And so we uh, set up a repeat experiment with a timed cull and we culled all the mice at that one week um, period where um, they, they still had some tumours. And so this is um, just showing some immunohistochemistry, showing we have this large EGFRV3 positive tumour in this mouse, quantitated um, down the bottom, and then looked at the infiltration of CD4 and CD8 T cells. And you can see them, there's some accumulation here at the border. And actually when uh, this is um, quantitated uh, by Valeria, sorry Valeria, I should have had your name on this slide. Um, when Valeria quantitated uh, the T cell infiltration, she looked at both in the tumour um, hemisphere and on the contralateral side of the brain, there were no T cells. So this indicated that the accumulation and recruitment of T cells was antigen specific. I think you'll also notice that there seems to be more CD4s and CD8s, and that's definitely a phenomenon that we see across, across cohorts. And whether or not this is reflective of um, enhanced proliferation of CD4s at the site, or whether it's all recruitment or whether it's due to a lack of CD8 T cell survival is not something we've unpacked yet. And that's definitely a question we're interested in asking into the future. 
So I'll just bring you back here. So this is just to show you that we've um, taken these um, assets now through the entire pipeline, made antibodies, screened them, and that we're now um, at term sheets to, to ready to translate these into the clinic. But um, we know that EGFRV3 is a single monotherapy is not going to work. The patients will definitely regress. Uh, we'll see tumour regressions, but the tumours are going to grow back. And you know, when we're thinking about um, brain tumours um, in adult, in all, in all, in all individuals, but I think particularly in children, you can't talk to a five-year-old. Um, about a five-year survival rate. You know, we've got to be going for cure. So we have to ha be able to multi-target and have, um, you know, therapies targeting multiple antigens so that we can wipe out all of those tumour cells at once. So the beauty of having something that is a, a primary target like EGFRV3, which is cancer specific, is that we can then use it in logic gating. So what that means is we can take our V3 specific binder, um, and I'm, I don't have uh, time to go into the details today, but we can use, um, uh, uh, synthetic biology and logic gating and cleavable transcription factors to induce secondary elements so that we can then, for example, have a second car that's expressed but only in the tumour microenvironment. And that means then we can go after and target proteins that might be expressed at a very high level in the tumour, but they might be expressed at a low level elsewhere in the body. We can also use these sorts of systems to induce um, cytokine, local, local cytokine or chemokine secretion to augment the tumour microenvironment, or also to induce uh, the local secretion of antibodies or, or other agents. So that's really the vision. Um, so now we come back to the uh, the novel binders, which is the cool, sexy stuff. So this is what we're you know really excited about now. Um, is we have some really nice data sets, and again, really a huge piece of work with our proteomics and our bioinformaticians here at WeHi. We're very lucky to have such um, such amazing uh, researchers. And so we take we look at something like this, a heat map, and we take our top most abundantly expressed proteins. Um, and we look at, say, the top quartile, and when we break this down and we look at adult and paediatric um, brain tumours, we get a heat map like this with a bunch of targets that are new and novel. And um, in fact, we have just say, for example, these 92 proteins um, out of those 92, 12 already known existing car targets that have been um, identified already in the literature, uh, but many are not. And so that's um, really exciting for us. And so if we just take a zoom in and take a closer look at one of these heat maps, this is the DIPG brainstem tumour I referred to here. And you'll be, some of you in the audience may be familiar with these proteins, CD276 and HER2, which are um, well known and, and characterised cancer antigens and not just in the brain, but in other indications as well. Um, and we have this other protein here, CDX, which is even more highly expressed in our brain tumours. And when we validate using flow cytometry, you can see it's really not, um, really highly expressed. So we take a, a number, we have, a, uh, have about 20 of these targets we're quite excited about, and then I go to Maria in the protein production facility and I say, hey Maria, can you make this into a recombinant protein for me? And she goes, yeah, let's give it a crack. So uh, Maria and her team are awesome and they make the recombinant protein bait, and then we can uh, work, partner with the Centre for Biologic Therapies and say, hey Jenny, what do you reckon? She goes, oh, it's exciting. Uh, and then we partner with CSL to use their um, antibody display platforms and make the antibodies. So we're just going through this process now um, uh, with targets and just as an example of the readout here, you can see we then engineer those SCFE or those antibody binding um, domains into our car uh, and take it through that pipeline. So for example, this is just a recent killing assay by Alex Davenport that we're quite excited about this target here, which is showing an even uh, greater improved um, anti-tumor response to this um, pediatric tumor, DIPG. Mm -hmm. So we can see good tumour regression um, in immunocompromised mice, and I, I mentioned that other protein already, HER2, so this is a paper we just published earlier this year, treating HER2 positive DIPG tumours that just hadn't been done uh, before in the literature, and we saw really nice um, anti-tumour responses. And then just last month, actually, um, or maybe six weeks ago now, Brainchild 4 um, was just uh, it, it approved and just gone into a phase one um, clinical trial. It's just opened in Seattle. And so this is a, a now a quad car. So this is this is really where the field is moving. It's moving extremely rapidly. So we're now um, in this trial, they're uh, creating a quad car product um, with four receptors on one cell to really tackle the heterogeneity um, um, of these solid tumours. And so we're really quite excited about this. And, and this is really the plan of how now we can start to feed in our novel cars um, into this kind of format and be able to, um, in addition to logic gating and, and other drugs. And so that's that's really exciting. But of course, you know, all of those animal um, 
experiments that I've shown you so far have been done in immunocompromised mice. They've been done in NSG mice. There are no good, um, well, we had to make one, but there's no good animal models for brain cancer. And so, um, you know, many clinical trials actually go from showing good efficacy in an immunocompromised mouse and then straight into the clinic. And it's really why a lot of clinical trials fail um, because uh, we're not testing our therapies in models that really recapitulate human disease. And what I mean by that is going back to that harsh um, tumor microenvironment and all of those other suppressive cells that are going to be shutting down the T cells and influencing um, trafficking and the like. So um, <clears throat> maybe that close your eyes for those of you that are a little bit squeamish uh, for this bit. But um, so we wanted to um, examine the efficacy of our therapies in the brain in syngenetic models in an intact immune system and be able to understand what was happening at the tumour because um, it's really hard to clear, to get full cures in mice that have an intact immune system. And so... Um, and so we, I recruited this very talented postdoc, Matthias Malazani, out from Germany, and he's just now just moved back to, Aust uh, to Vienna. And we, he um, worked to establish a chronic cranial window implant, uh, which provides a long-term, real-time window into the brain of an, you know, of a, of an immunocompetent mouse. Oh. It's a tongue twister. Um, and so here we can examine the extent of T cell infiltration, accumulation, directionality, velocity of the cells and the like. And I think you can appreciate these sort of blood vessels here that you can see in the brain are the same blood vessels in this image on the right. So this is a mouse that's been then injected with dextran. So it lights up all the blood vessels. Um, and then we can see this growing, glio uh, growing glioma in the mouse. So this pink um, splodge here is actually the glioblastoma. And I think what you can appreciate here is this is an anesthetized mouse under the microscope and we can image it every week and watch the growing cells. And I think you can really see the single cell resolution of the tumor. And I think what also this nicely demonstrates is how hard it is for our surgeons to remove these um, tumors. I think in other solid tumors, it's really easy to take margins. Um, and we, of course, we can't do that when you're working inside someone's delicate brain uh, where you don't want their quality of life to suffer as a result of their brain surgery. So, um, so when Matthias then went on to then treat these mice, so we had the growing gliomas in the brains of the mice, and he's then delivered an intravenous injection of CAR T cells, and that's sh they're shown here in yellow. Um, actually, he saw, and this is a, I mean, it's a beautiful video. You can see the T cells coming in and sort of migrating around the tumor. Some of them are infiltrating, and some of them are tracking along. And but whilst this is qualitative and, and pretty, it's actually highly quantitative. And he's painstakingly tracked individual cells, thousands of individual cells, and looked at their velocity and the, the straightness of their tracks and overwhelmingly noticed they were all really straight. So what that means is the T cells were coming in and they were hitting the tumour and then they were migrating around the tumour wall. They were just skirting around the edge of the tumour. And so what we're looking at here is um, this particular video is 150 microns depth and we can image up to 700 microns, but that's is still really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of looking at the whole brain tumour as a whole. So we then worked with um, uh, Kelly Rogers and Verena and her very talented team. Thank you to Verena for this to use tissue clearing. And so tissue clearing is a set of techniques that allows you to render biological tissues transparent. So you can then um, image the whole brains in, in great detail, but maintaining all of those um, cellular and molecular structures within the intact tissue. So it basically removes all the molecules that scatter light, um, and, and that's what makes the tissue opaque. So working with the team, we were able to clear whole brains um, of these out of these mice. So there's a tumour in here um, using... Uh, clearing has cleared it out, and then we can actually see this in more detail, and then we can use um, light sheet microscopy to image through the tumour. Um, Matthias carefully quantitated um, the CX3-CR1 mice. So these are, um, these are uh, tumours growing in a mouse uh, that is CX3-CR1 positive, and as you can see here, they absolutely... Um, line up around the tumour board. I'm just trying to find my little mouse here so I can show you. We can see it. Okay. And so out here, um, the, uh, they exhibit characteristics like, um, kind of like dendritic cells. So these microglia are the most prevalent immune cell in the brain. 
and they have large dendritic type processes. And so you can see out here, distal to the tumour, they have these large processes, but as actually as they line up around this tumour border, Oh, there we go. You can see they have a more activated morphology and um, what that means is that they um, have more enlarged cell bodies and sort of shorter, stumpier, thicker processes. And he's already, he's also had a look in human tumours and this um, is the same in human tumours as well. Um, and it's, um, I've been, you know, so let me, reading it, I've been reading a lot of literature recently and so there's been a bunch of papers looking at um, the role of microglia in a variety of diseases that, you know, not just brain cancer, but for example, Parkinson's disease and as well, and really shown that um, actually these microglia um, can cause um, induction of T cells to infiltrate and they can lead to damage of the BBB, of the blood brain barrier, and they can also express high levels of MHC class two and then shut down T cells. So this got us thinking about what's happening at this tumor cell border. We're seeing the T cells come in and skirt around these tumours and also the microglia are there too. So they um, are they interacting? And sort of, of course, being an immunologist from Melbourne, we called them TRAMs, tumour rim associated macrophages, because if you're gonna have carpooling and cars carpooling, you have to have TRAMs as well. Um, and uh, again, this is, he's really looked at thousands uh, of these and really quantitated, quantitated the distance of these microglia from the tumour and found that they were actually creating a wall. So we were keen to understand these interactions in more detail and, um, and recently added spatial transcriptomics to our suite of spatial proteomics technologies in the quest to understand this region to see if we can improve our immunotherapies by manipulating it. So these are um, glioma. This is, a, this is one big glioma tumour here growing in a mouse brain. Um, and then uh, what we did was take a section of this brain and apply it to a chip um, and fixed and permeabilized it. And then the mRNA hybridizes with a spatially barcoded probe and then use reverse transcription to um, analyze the transcripts in, in space. And so what you can, I think, appreciate here, if you just sort of really look at the colors, if you look at the colors inside the tumor, this is a tumor on this UMAP um, plot here. And here's our tram population here in this sort of cluster nine and shown in the green is separating the tumor from, um, from the non-tumor uh, part of the brain. And so uh, remember that the T cells are crawling around the tumour border and um, hitting uh, microglia. The hypothesis is that if we can remove the microglia, we can perhaps improve T cell trafficking into the tumour and therefore improve um, tumour regressions in syngenaic models. So we used a, a CSF1 receptor inhibitor um, which drug which targets microglia. So this is the same um, brain that I just showed you before, but just looking at the transcript of this um, transcript AIF1 to mark the microglia. And then we depleted the microglia. Um, and then now we're examining the differences um, in these tumours. And this is just showing you there that we've, we've quantitated it um, in detail. And so um, I think, you know, the... The, the literature is still out, but there's certainly a lot of um, a lot of literature to show that microglia are, um, are inhibiting T cells, and so we are quite. This is an active area of interest for us moving forward. And so this now brings me to um, right on time. It's not like me. Um, uh, this brings me to my my sort of final slide, really, which is just to try and pull all this together, and tell you that. Um, First of all, that I'm really excited about what we've built in the last um, six years. I, I really am. And I think, you know, um, applying immunotherapy in the brain does hold great promise, both from, you know, looking at how we can improve uh, and tailor T cell phenotypes, how we can multi target um, our CAR T cells so, and apply them to brain tumors so that we can go for cure and we're not getting um, antigen escape. I haven't had time to talk about this work today, but we're also working with um, Tony Purcell at Monash and we've been looking using immunopeptidomics to map the immunopeptidome um, of these brain tumours as well so that we can also make, because Mirio, the company that made, our, that made the O2 binders, uh, are quite expert at making um, antibodies binders to peptide MHC so we can make CAR, um, uh, peptide MHC specific CARs as well as cancer vaccines using mRNA technology and that's exploding in the precinct as well. So we're all poised to take advantage of that. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, as I said before, we, you know, the the vision here is not necessarily to deliver these therapies as a monotherapy, but be definitely delivering them in combination, and um, 
with drugs, so whether that's through, you know, Andreas's and uh, Diane's BH3 program uh, in combination with checkpoint blockade uh, and other modulators to um, augment the tumour micro environment. Um, and I also mentioned how, um, you know, some of the targets, uh, you know, might be able to take advantage of synthetic biology and logic gating so that we can restrict uh, so we can improve safety by restricting the T cell responses uh, to the environment that they belong in the brain. Um, and of course, working really closely with our clinical colleagues to uh, to translate everything we do. And we and we do really um, genuinely think about that translation step at every part of the way from how we design our vectors, um, you know, what media we use. As soon as you sort of go to cell therapies and say, oh, we've got something for you. And they say, yes, but now you have to repeat everything without serum and take out the tags and get rid of antibiotic resistance. And there's, you know, that translation step, I've definitely been learning a lot um, over the last couple of years. So it's been really um, helpful to now think and shape how we design our experiments so that we're more poised for that step. And in my final slide, I'll just mention the Brain Cancer Centre. So we sit here as an immunotherapy program, but work very closely with our other four discovery pillars um, and with the clinical trials program and the data registry. So that brings me to the end of my time. So I just want to acknowledge that this is a huge body of work um, over the last six years with an incredible team. And I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, Ryan Cross, who's really helped uh, really shape a lot of these programs and been a driving force in the establishment of all the technologies as well. So thank you very much, Ryan. You've been um, uh, really outstanding. Uh, Beck, Kathy, Melinda, um, I've meant, tried to mention everyone as I went along because I knew I wouldn't have time to say everyone by name, but there you all are. And I love you all and appreciate you all so much. And, um, you know, we really work well together as a team and I'm really proud of you all. Uh, we have incredible collaborators. Um, right from our biotech uh, collaborators in Mirio and TCR Squared, our clinical collaborators, Kate, Mark, Maury, Heidi, Ruth, Alana, we couldn't do any of this work without you. Our structural biology um, colleagues have really changed the way we think about receptor design, which has been an amazing asset. But I've mentioned proteomics and bioinformatics. You're all amazing. Um, Centre for Dynamic Imaging, everyone else listed there. Um, you've just been extraordinary support. Uh, our other collaborators, including um, uh, hospitals, protein production, the VPCC, Monash, Peter Mac. There's been a large number of institutes uh, that we've uh, received help, supports, guidance and reagents from. And I think we're really lucky at WeHi to have such an incredible professional services team that really underpin everything we do. It's one thing saying we're going to do a great experiment and look, I've got a therapy I can take through to the clinic, but I really help rely on my the BDO team and the finance team and the IT team. So thank you. Um, thank you to everyone and particularly philanthropy. Um, and our generous supporters, because none of this work would have happened without you guys. I started my lab knowing nothing about brain cancer, uh, but with a great idea and a lot of really clever people around me who were willing to help and support. And it was through a few early, you know, philanthropic grants that really was able to establish the lab. And so I look back now and I'm very proud of what we've built together. Um, and uh, the biobanks and the generous, the generosity of patients and families that give up their tissue uh, and have those really difficult conversations. Um, and particularly, you know, for some of these kids, it's through a rapid autopsy program. And that's really hard for the families, um, you know, to, to, to be able to participate in that. But such a generous uh, and valuable gift for us so that we can start to um, make these new therapies and help other people into the future. And um, these consumer advocate team here, and thank you all for coming, guys. You're all just sitting down here. Thanks for coming. Uh, keep us grounded and remind us why we get up every morning and why we're doing what we do. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Misty. Um, we'll take questions from the floor. And if you're online, please put through your questions on Slido and we'll try and read them out. Tim was up just before. <laughs> um, so so some, some of these brain tumours are, are quite large. So how, how does the brain deal with a whole bunch of cells just dying? Um, so, so in the case of glioblast, sorry, in, sorry, I'll answer two part answer to that. One in in the adult setting for adult glioblastoma that do have a large tumor bulk, overwhelmingly all of those patients are going to have those tumors removed. So there'll be tumor debulking surgery, um, and then they'll have their therapy to hit what's left. 
in the paediatric setting, um, you're right, and that's why there no been, have been no clinical trials. Brainchild that opened last month, Brainchild 4 is the first one that have targeted brain tumours in the pons, in the brain stem, because that's exactly what clinicians were worried about. So they took the cohort of patients that had diffuse midline glioma, but had tumour bulk in different parts of the brain and spinal spinal tumours and actually they saw no toxicities and no and actually the, the kit they have to be managed this is let's not let's not be too light-hearted about this these patients are delivered in an intensive care setting and monitored very closely yeah. but and the clinical trials to date have shown that they have been able to be delivered safely so i'd also imagine that the result of this treatment um, causes a large number of chopped up bits of protein and do they raise is there a sort of immune reaction against uh, those proteins? I can imagine could, there would be, but it's could, a great question. But it, no, it's just such early days. No one's really looked yet. Yeah, because they could be a potential source of new antigens. One hundred percent, and epitope spreading and all of that for sure. Yeah. Um, Misty, um, I I was wondering in this model with the. Um, window into the brain in the immunoactive uh, mouse. Yes. So the first tumor that you showed was highly infiltrated. It was small and highly infiltrated. The next tumor that you showed was more the mic like. microglia rim and the T cells sort of scooting around the outside was quite a bit bigger, but didn't seem to be quite as infiltrative. Yeah. Does that mean I mean, what happens to the infiltrated cells? They were different. Again, everything's model specific as well. Yeah. So they were diff two different models. One was a GL261 and one's a CT2A, so different cells and different times. So when they're earlier and actively dividing, they're more uh, uh, infiltrative. Mm -hmm. And then that, that one that I showed you that was pretty big, it was pretty massive. It was caused, it had a lot of pressure in the brain. Mm -hmm. It took up, I think you saw from the immunohistochemistry, it took up a large chunk of the brain. And then it was more ball like. But if actually if you zoomed in, there it was very um, uh, had a lot of processes. Yeah, I was just wondering if the CAR T cells can actually reach the infiltrating cells, or whether the microglia sort of, you know, it's one thing um, patrolling and defending a, a large tumor. Um, Another thing would be to defend every single infiltrating cell. So do you see any cell death under those circumstances there with the CAR T cells? Do you mean when in in the you know, you told us about the microglia essentially uh, defending their territory there. Well, the I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're defending the territory, but um, they're they're both there. And yeah. so that's what we're now trying to understand is how they're interacting yeah. um, by what Molecularly, literally, how they're interacting. Okay. We haven't got that far ahead yet. But what sort of death do you see? Tumor cell death do you see in that model, if any? Oh, we see in in over the small periods that we're imaging over a couple of hours, you do see some death, but overwhelmingly not not a lot. And I think that's what is very surprising to me because I'm I must um, I hypothesise that the T cells would come in, and you're right, find a gap in the armour, and then attached to the antigen and arrest, you know, stop moving. But we we don't we see that in a very small proportion of cells. So I don't know, we don't know why that is. Uh, we don't know why we're not seeing more cells forming immune, immune synapses with the tumour and arresting and seeing more kind of apoptosis at that cell line. It might be that tumour border rather. It might be that we're not imaging for long enough. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of other um, cells, of course, in that dark space that I'm not that we're not examining too. So we don't know what else is in there, and that's what we're hoping that the um, spatial transcriptomics will help us unpack. Thanks, Missy. Uh, some more questions. No, anything online, Jacqueline? Okay. While well, I'm on the way to Jason's far flung question. I've got one for you. Can you use your systems to try and work out how big a problem tumor heterogeneity is? So you control the expression of the target antigen in your models. Can you titrate that down and yeah, see that's, how much killing you need? That's exactly what we're doing. And that's what we've got Yasmin in the lab about to start as a postdoc to, to do exactly that. So to take, to implant tumors of various antigen heterogeneous ratios um, and then look at how we can treat. And then, so then, you know, the the future, I think, is very personalised. So, you know, you'll be able to biopsy from different parts of the tumour or undergo a resection, really understand what the heterogeneity is, and then tailor your 
quad penta car therapy in combination with a drug. And I think that's that's the future. Yeah, that was basically the question I was going to ask. <laughs> if, <laughs> Sorry, Jason. If you are like Jess. removing the tumour and like what I guess what's being done to understand yeah, yeah. what are the critical exactly. uh, surface proteins, but also fantastic talk. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. And so, for example, EGFR V3, for example, is, you know, right now patients get biopsied and then they're told, oh, your tumour is positive or negative. But we know it's not as simple as that, right? So you might have an EGFR V3 positive mutated tumour, but that protein might only be expressed on 30% of the tumour bulk. And so we know that that's why kind of three antigens is the magic number, because that gives us 100% coverage across the tumour. So that's that's sort of where the field is going, where our research program is going. Misty, thank you for a most beautiful talk. So in terms of design, let's say when you get up to that quad um, CAR T cell, yeah. how, how many design principles do people overlay there? So like when they do the quad, is it all SCFV, you know, one particular kind of transmembrane or, you know? No, it, yeah. uh, the, that particular product is, but I don't think it has to be. I think you could have a, you know, a nanobody CAR, a heavy chain only, you could have a SCFE car and then you could have a ligand car on the same cell. That particular trial, um, the manufacturing process is such that they basically take the, all the different individual viruses and then dump them on the one product. So in the one product, you've got cell, you've got CAR T cells that express one or two or three or four cars um, rather than transducing them all individually. So you've got a combination. And I think because, you know, it's easy to say, oh, let's just make a quad car, but actually that quadruples the cost of manufacturing, which we know is also prohibitive and a huge bottleneck for the translation of these therapies. So um, that's that's how they've dealt with that is just by saying, okay, so some of the cells will be single specific and some will have three or four cars. And then I think the interesting question is, and none of that work is published, um, that haven't published any papers, this has gone straight to the clinic. And so, you know, I think that's sort of what we're trying to understand, you know, with Phil Hodgkin's help is, you know, what are the rules, you know, how can we actually tailor this better to maybe predict how best to combine those kinds of receptors together? Excellent. Okay, well, we're right on time. If you have any more questions, please feel free to approach Missy and ask later. But um, thanks again for a wonderful talk and great discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.